Thank you for listening to a Christ-centered message from Grace Community Church. We are committed to proclaiming the authority of God's Word without apology and trust that you will receive encouragement as we study today's passage together. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7. You delight in showing mercy. Can I ask us that question? Can I ask you that question this morning? Are you merciful? If you ask that question, am I merciful? Am I a merciful person? This question is of utmost importance. We're going to tackle this together from Jesus' message, continue in this series, Counter Culture, going verse by verse, Matthew's five, Matthew 5, 6, and chapter 7. And it's causing us, beloved, to examine our hearts. That as we go up like the Psalms of Ascent did, Beatitudes, through the Beatitudes, through the sermon, it actually is going deeper by layer and layer into the core of our being, into our, our souls, our hearts, our, our motives, our attitudes, so much deeper, beloved, than just our actions, what we do, what we don't do. What if every member of this congregation was truly a merciful person? And as we think about that question and as the sermon unfolds and we think of it defined the way Jesus intended for it to be, imagine, listen, I can say this with all authority, if his followers, if his disciples would have, if they would have done what we commonly do, well, I hope that person over there heard this sermon. That was for them. That was for my wife. That was for the, I'm going to send this sermon off to the, you know, well, that's good. But Jesus' disciples actually heard what he said and they took it to heart and they lived it out and many of them died. And 2,000 years later on a different continent, we're here today, beloved, because they didn't alter his message. They allowed the message of the King of Kings to radically change their lives. And I'm wondering if God would do that in and through us, in and through his church. What kind of impact would we have on the community around us and the world at large if we were a body of merciful people? D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he says it this way. He says, the Christian gospel places all its primary emphasis upon being rather than doing the gospel puts a greater weight upon our attitude than upon our actions. In the first instance, its main stress is on what you and I essentially are rather than what we do. Religion deals with what you do and don't do. A saving relationship with Christ fundamentally changes who we are. And that then presses out into every corner of our thinking and of our lives. And it changes us because it changes you and me from the inside out. So remember, we're looking at what, it, what is up this upside down life. Our goal is not to live like everybody else. We don't pursue the things that everybody else pursues, beloved. We are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And this sermon takes a turn that it begins to impact and affect other people around us. As believers, we understand I've been condemned by the law. I have seen my great need for mercy. And in seeing that need for mercy, the gospel then has given to me the Christ who saves all sinners who come to him. And so now I live out a reality of the grace and mercy of God. And this is a life that is transformed. And we're given a family, a new family, and we're given an inheritance that is eternal. And it's all because of God's mercy. So let's go back to the mountain. And let's hear, understand, and obey the message of our King, beloved. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the what? Kingdom of heaven. This is what a disciple says. This is their confession. I'm poor. I'm spiritually bankrupt. I have nothing. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. This is how a citizen of God's kingdom feels. For they shall be, what's the promise of blessing? Comforted. Verse 5, blessed are the meek. This is how a disciple thinks. So when somebody comes to them and says, you know, you're not doing right. You know, this isn't right. They already have admitted I'm, I'm spiritually bankrupt and I mourn over my sin, so I'm not offended at you. This is how I think, for they and Jesus promised shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who, and this is what a disciple pursues, hunger and thirst for righteousness. And what's the promise of blessing? For they shall be filled, satisfied. Nothing else will satisfy you. Today's verse, blessed are the merciful. What's the promise? For they shall receive mercy. This, beloved, is how a disciple responds. Now we're moving into action. Now we're moving beyond just, well, that's how I think. That's what I say. This is how I feel. I welcome. I, I'm pursuing. Well, what does it mean to pursue, to hunger and thirst after righteousness? This has everything to do with being merciful. So this is the proposition that I have. This is the claim, and it's also an invitation. And it's this, beloved, that you would enjoy the blessing of being mercied by God to mercy others. Now I've switched, and I'm using the word as a verb. That God has mercied disciples of Jesus. For what reason? It surely isn't to put a plaque or hang a flag in your yard or a banner replacing political signs. I've been mercied. What for? To mercy others. It's for a reason. So first of all, let's explain mercy, all right? Mercy explained. If we're going to understand what it is to, to partake of this blessing, this is an invitation that if you're here and you have not yet been mercied by God, he is waiting to extend his mercy to you. Mercy, beloved, is not to be confused with leniency, tolerance, or indifference. Okay, it's not merciful to ignore wrong injustice, the plight of others, sin, and claim I'm being merciful. No. For the father who comes home from work, he's had a long day and he just has to plop in the chair and he ignores everyone or we need the man cave and we got to get away to my own space. And you don't know what's going on in the family and you're not interacting with your loved ones for that little moment we call time. That's not being merciful. Well, they just don't want to put up with me. I've had a bad day. I'm being merciful to them. No, you're not. That's being lazy and self-centered. There's a good chance you might get offended in today's sermon, by the way, okay? It's been offending me all week, so I'm bringing some offense to you, all right? If I, if I offend us, I've done my job, Okay? There's a point to this, all right? It's not just to be brutal, okay? Listen to what Proverbs 21, 13 says. Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. You know there's a need, but you just put on the headphones and you just block it out. Beloved, mercy is the opposite of cruelty, Okay, so it's helpful for us. So understanding mercy, well, what it is not, you know, it's not leniency. It's not tolerance or indifference. Uh, we just don't care. It's the opposite. You, as far as away from cruelty as you can get, you find mercy. Now, the Bible is not obscure about how God feels toward a person who lives merciless, devoid of mercy. 
The psalmist says in Psalm 109, 16 and 17, talking about the wicked person, well, what makes him, what is a manifestation of his wickedness? He did not remember to show kindness. He had an opportunity to show kindness, but instead he pursued the poor and needy and the brokenhearted to put them to death. He loved to curse, so let curses come upon him. He did not delight in blessing. May it be far from him. God delights in blessing. So when someone does not delight in blessing, they're bringing hell up, not heaven down. Mercy is having compassion for people in need. Just a simple definition I asked you the question, am I merciful? Okay, let me ask you, here's what this means. Are you compassionate towards others who are in need? Do you see their need? Do you feel their need? And do you respond? Compassion is not compassion unless it results in action. Just have an empathy or or I feel bad for you, but but if you don't respond by, by doing something, praying for them, and then, Lord, open the door. How can I minister mercy to them? I love mercy, and I've I've taught it this way for years, and it's true, but it's insufficient, all right? Here's what mercy is. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. What do we deserve? Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, hell to pay. I deserve hell. Mercy is, I'm not headed to hell anymore. Okay, that's true. Grace, grace is receiving what I don't deserve, that I, that I get Jesus, the Holy Spirit, a new family, heaven, presence with God forever and ever. I don't deserve that. That's grace, his blessing in my life. Mercy, I'm not getting what, I, what is owed me, hell. I am receiving so many blessings from the Lord. I, that's grace and mercy. So that's true, but it doesn't quite capture what Jesus is on about here. It's kind of like the threshold to move forward from there. That mercy is a strong sense of pity that is accompanied by a great desire to relieve suffering. So let me ask you that question. When you see others in need, do you have a strong sense of pity and you desire to relieve their suffering? Repeated cry throughout the Gospels. People everywhere. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. What are they asking him to do? See our condition? Do you see us? We're over here. We're not in the mainstream. We're not with everybody else. Look on us and come near to us and engage in our plight. Rescue us. Deliver us. Sinclair Ferguson, he says it this way. I think it's helpful. Mercy. Mercy is getting down on your hands and knees and doing what you, can re- what you can do to restore dignity to someone whose life has been broken by sin. Now, it may be their own sin. It may be that they have been sinned against and just ruined. And mercy says, I'm not gonna walk away. I'm not gonna run away. I'm going to come near and get low to help you. Sinclair Ferguson also says it this way. He says, kindness is a friend calling you when you're well. Hey, how's it going? Good. How you doing? Good, good. Everything's good. Sunshiny day. Yep, great. Mercy is a friend calling you when you're sick. Yeah, but then they might ask me to do something. That I might get sick. I'm going to stay away. I'm busy. We could add mercy is you calling a friend saying you need help moving. (laughs) Oh, my back, you know, I got things, I got, I'm busy. But I would add something to Sinclair's very straightforward definition. Mercy is not sitting here saying, yeah, and when I was sick the last time, they didn't call me and they didn't call me and that other friend, they didn't call me, they, they didn't call me. Mercy is covering when people don't meet your standard and you cover them with grace. To be unmerciful is to keep a list of all the people that didn't do what you thought they should have done, and they failed you. 
But if you recognize I'm spiritually bankrupt, I have nothing, and you mourn over your sin, how can anyone fail you to that point? And ever derail you from showing mercy to others? Micah 6, 8, he has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? You want it? All right, here you go. Three things. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Notice that he doesn't say do mercy. The religious person will try to do, I got to do what I got to do. All right, tell me what I got to do, pastor. But to love mercy, to love mercy, kindness, that is very different. Because you will not be derailed. You will not be distracted. You will keep loving mercy. And so will I. Boyce describing the difference between grace and mercy to help us understand these, the nuances, the specific intentionality between these words. He says, primarily, and he's talking about mercy, primarily it is the quality of helplessness or misery on the part of those who receive mercy. I'm mourn. I'm poor in spirit, okay? Grace is love when love is undeserved. Mercy is grace in action. It's doing something about it. Mercy is love reaching out to help those who are helpless and who need salvation. Grace starts it all in motion. Mercy moves it out into action. Grace, here's the plan of the battle. Here's the plan of the war. Mercy is, let's walk, let's march, let's go, let's, let's take the hill. Let's set the captives free. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he says it this way. He says, the best definition of the two, talking about grace and mercy, that I've ever encountered is this. Grace is especially associated with men and their sins. Mercy is especially associated with men in their misery. In other words, while grace looks down upon sinners as a whole, mercy looks especially upon the miserable consequences of sin. So that mercy really means a sense of pity plus a desire to relieve the suffering. Mercy is a divine attribute of God. It's not not leniency, it's not tolerance, it's not indifference. It's for sure the opposite of meanness and cruelty. Mercy is having compassion for people in need. Well, why would we do this, Pastor? It's rooted and grounded in the nature and the character and the attributes of God. It's a theme replete throughout the Scripture that God is merciful. When he looked down and saw the misery of his people in Egypt, he sent Moses. Okay, he just didn't say, oh, whew, they are having one hard time in Egypt. I know about it. He called Moses at the burning bush, said, go, I'm sending you. Go to Pharaoh and say, the God who reigns over everything said, let his people out of here. And if you don't, it's not going to go well for you. You can read it in Exodus. Moses learned of the character and the nature of the Lord. The Lord passed before him, Exodus 34, 6, and proclaimed. Remember when he's hidden in the cleft of the rock? The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He's revealing himself to Moses. The psalmist prays the character of God in Psalm 86, 15, and he says, but you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's that Hebrew word, hesed, loving kindness, steadfast love. See, a religious person, they say judgment for you, mercy for me. Law for you, grace for me. You don't keep my standard, I cut you off, I unfriend you, you're out. They know nothing of grace and they know nothing of mercy. Jonah was a guy like this. Go to Nineveh. Nineveh? You said run away from Nineveh? Okay. 
headed to Tarshish, went down, went down, went down. Thrown into the sea, swallowed up by the fish, spit out on the shore. Okay, I'll go. Thank you for delivering me. He goes and preaches, 40 days, repent, 40 days. I did my job, check. Now I'm going to sit and I'm going to wait on the judgment of God to fall. And then the judgment didn't fall, mercy fell. And the city repented from the king all the way down to animals. I mean, just every, it's wholesale repentance, fear of God. And Jonah is not singing any praise songs. He's not singing, you delight in mercy. He's indicting God. He's blaming God. You showed mercy on them, and he's excusing himself. Jonah chapter four and verse two. And this is in a prayer. And he prayed, this is a religious, religious as you can get right here, the prophet of God praying to the Lord. And this is what he said, oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? Didn't you get my memo, Lord? I mean, we had some serious prayer meetings over this election, Lord, and you must be, where are you? Okay, I'm, now we're bringing it home to roost, right? That's why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. That's why I did what I did. Because I knew you. You are a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. And I love it when it's all poured out on me, but you poured it out on our enemies and let's not be confused. What the enemies, those Ninevites did to their enemies was horrific. They would stake their enemies, put them on a stake, skin them alive. Okay, that's who he's praying about. So you can maybe empathize a little bit with, I didn't see that happening over the course of the last week. I pray that it doesn't happen in our nation, that one political party sees that's the way to respond to the other political party and we'll teach you a lesson. But we do it through words. And Jonah's indicting the Lord. He's blaming the Lord. He's saying, what I did, see, I'm actually right in what I did. And you're wrong. Well, how do we know that Jonah finally, the Lord was merciful to him? Because he didn't edit anything when he put this in the, in the scripture. He didn't portray himself as, well, I was praying with the Lord and, and I really wanted the best for the Ninevites. And, you know, and I really, like he didn't say it that way. He put it right down on the bottom shelf. Look at the religious guy who has hatred in his heart and without the mercy of the Lord impacting and changing him, we don't have this account. And when the book of Jonah ends, it ends with almost an open-ended what happened there for a reason. Because for you and me, it's not so much about how Jonah responded. It's how will you respond and how will I respond. I'll tell you, this week, another article released. A lot of the headlines, celebrity pastor is fired for infidelity. Pastor of a large church in New York City unfaithful to his wife. Upon reading that, and if you, you know, you look at the picture of the guy and, you know, what he, how he dresses and what he looks like, and my first response was not mercy. An easy response, a knee-jerk response, look at, look at the guy. Somebody actually on Twitter posted, you know, like, who, this guy? Like, you, you, any confusion over this guy in trouble? I relate to that. What about his wife? What about his kids? What about that church? What about the person that he slept with who's not his wife? And that's sin. Sin. That means there's people hurting because of sin. Was my first pastoral response of compassion? No. And then I'm preparing this sermon. Thanks, Lord. It, the Lord keeps doing this to me, like every week. It's like, hey, let's see how... In no way is that justifying what he did. In no way is that justifying a ministry that is all lights and, and, and smoke and, and, but there's people there and they're made in the image of God and how we look on them tells the story if we really understand God's mercy or not. And once again, 
I need to grow in God's mercy. I don't think that he's going to be calling me for advice or help, but I care about his wife and I care about his children and I care about the church and I care about the testimony of Christ and I care that now when people say, oh, you're a pastor, that's a pastor, you're all the same. And the gospel is hurt. Oh, that we would show mercy. Okay, so that's mercy explained. But let's get beyond that to mercy experienced. If we're gonna know the blessing of God, if we're gonna enjoy the blessing of God, that we've been mercied by God, the mercy of others, and we gotta understand what it is. So there's the explanation. But we need to experience this mercy. Who are the recipients of God's mercy? And Jesus says they're the merciful. They're the ones who shall receive mercy. So the question is, is Jesus teaching that it's our mercy, our mercy that causes God to be merciful? That's the response. So I started the ball in motion and he responds. I'm merciful and I put the ball in God's court and now you're, no, 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 that doesn't square with scripture. We're not the cause that affects God's mercy. If we have tasted of God's mercy, then here's what Jesus is saying. Then we will be merciful. We'll have confidence in God's mercy. Beloved, God pours out his mercy freely upon sinners. And praise God for this. This is the beauty of the gospel. This is the importance of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, that sinners can be forgiven if they cry out to the Lord for mercy. That the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ on the cross in the place of every sinner who would ever turn from their sin and trust in the Lord Jesus. And by faith, that transaction, the great exchange, and the Lord is able to have mercy on us and not violate his just character. Because he can't just look the other way and he can't do what a lazy parent does and just wink at sin. He has to deal with it. And how did he deal with it? He took it on himself. That's love. That's mercy. Paul, he received God's mercy, and for the rest of his life, he placarded it everywhere he went. Let me tell you of God's mercy, God's mercy, God's mercy. 1 Timothy 1.13, he writes to Timothy, he says, though formerly, let me tell you who I was. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but... It's like, you were a Pharisee of the Pharisee, Travis Benjamin, you were all that. Yeah, no, here's who I really was. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the Lord was merciful to me, is what he's saying. 1 Timothy 1.16, a few verses later, Paul says, But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, you want to know who the number one sinner is? Paul's saying, it's me. And I'd be like, ah, oh, Paul, you didn't meet me yet. And you might say, well, you, you know everything about me? Paul is saying the foremost that Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example for those who were to believe in him for eternal life. This is the beauty of it, beloved. There's no one we're gonna meet and they're gonna say, you know what? I'm beyond mercy. I'm beyond God's ability to show grace. Oh, let me tell you about a man named Saul of Tarsus. There's hope for you. There's hope for me. Paul wrote, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. He wrote to the church at Ephesus and he highlighted the mercy of God in salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, and he says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Well, that's not good. What, what, what good can we do when we're dead? Nothing. And he says, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Among whom, verse 3, we all once lived. How did we live? What was our testimony before Christ? Before the gospel, before salvation, before new birth, he describes it and he pulls no punches. Once we lived in the passions of our flesh. What do I want to do? When do I want to do what I want to do? It's all, it's all about me. Carrying out the desires of the body and mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. Now, if that ended there, we're in trouble, beloved. But this three-letter word, but. But God. Say that with me. But God. Okay? You are on your road to hell, but God, 
I could title a sermon right there, okay? But God, being rich in what? Mercy. Because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, what did he do? Made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have, do you hear Paul just like, strike up the band already. Let's go with this already. And he's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. If your world is wrecked because of who may or may not win the election, you're missing this, beloved. Where you're seated is not just the address and zip code that they ask you to verify stuff. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we're seated with Christ in heaven, and he isn't going to be impeached. He's not up for election or re-election, and he'll never be put out of office. All right, this is Jesus, our king, and this is what he says. Well, why would he do all this? Verse 7, underline it, highlight it, put a tattoo on your shoulder if you have to, whatever, okay? Listen to what's in store for disciples of Jesus Christ. So that, that's a purpose clause. Where's this all going? It's not just for you to have your best life now. Because when you lose your job, you lose your health, you, you say goodbye to a loved one that you love dearly. If you were banking on it's all for me right here, right now, then your hope begins to falter and your faith begins to shake because you thought that Jesus was like a genie to give me everything I want now. Oh, no. No, no. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we're headed somewhere. We're going somewhere so that in the eight coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness, there it is, toward us. How is all this possible? In Christ Jesus. You think you've seen a grandparent dote and spoil their grandkids? You haven't seen anything of what the Father is waiting to do, all accomplished by the Spirit and the Son for all eternity. These are my kids. This is my family. These belong to me, and my son paid with his life, and he will lavish on the saints for all eternity his mercy, which is grounded in his love. That'll let you sing when everything seems to be all out of order and all chaotic. I looked up, I think it was this morning, real early, I was outside. I looked up, there's the moon. Just like, clear sky. Like, you know what? God is in control. The Lord reigns. And we can trust him. William Reed Newell, overwhelmed by mercy, wrote the song at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. How many of you say that? I lived for years, maybe decades, and I knew about Jesus dying, but I didn't know he died for me, and I didn't even know why. That was just kind of silly. Why would he die for me? I'm not that bad. By God's word, at last, my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I spurned till my guilty soul imploring turned. Where? To Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Verse four, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span. Where? At Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There, my burdened soul found liberty. Where? At Calvary. Yeah, it's noon, right on cue. Have you been to Calvary? Is that your testimony? Have you been set free? 
Beloved, God will pour out his mercy. He will pour out his mercy freely upon sinners. But listen to me, pay attention now. God will pour out his judgment righteously upon the merciless. God will pour out his judgment righteously upon the merciless. Now, who are those without mercy? Well, you have the rebellious and you have the religious. The rebellious person, I don't need, you know, I don't need God's mercy. I don't deserve God's mercy. I don't want God's mercy. What a waste. But they need the mercy of the Lord. Just like in Luke 18 and verse 13, when the tax collector standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but what did he do? He beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That if a, if a person who is rebellious here it's under the sound of my voice, if they hear this message and they say, Lord, have mercy on me, he will hear, he will pour out his mercy. But what about the religious person? Oh, I've done this. I was baptized here. I did this. I'm a member. I do that. I'm all these things. I have all the right doctrine and all the right opinions. Well, if they haven't experienced God's mercy, they need God's mercy. James 2 and verse 13, the brother of Jesus writes, for judgment is without mercy to the one who's shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The song that was just sung before the sermon. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The rebellious person, the religious person, if they do not repent of their rebellion and religiosity, then they will have God's righteous wrath poured out on them in judgment. Have you experienced the mercy of God for yourself? This is what it is to be made righteous. This is what it is to then avoid the coming judgment because Jesus was judged and the wrath of God was poured out on him in your place. Have you experienced the mercy of God? I want to take us to another direction, and that is how the mercy is exemplified in Jesus. How did Jesus exemplify? How did he illustrate the mercy of God? Because that's going to matter to us. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus taught, and we studied this a couple of years ago, and our study through the Gospel of Luke on the, on the Samaritan, all right? We commonly know it as the Good Samaritan. In his teaching, he exemplified mercy. And in Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter, the question is asked of Jesus by a very religious person trying to justify himself, trying to be okay, in verse 25, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. He's just trying to trap him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law, and how do you read it? And this lawyer, okay, so it's a lawyer is a, a person very well studied in uh, the law of God, all right? They could parse it out. They were very religious, okay? Everybody would look to them like, look how great they are. And so he answered in verse 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, Jesus, said to him, you have answered correctly, do this, and you will live. And there's a problem. Because on one hand, he's saying, I've done all that, but if he's honest, and he is some to some degree honest, he's saying, but I still have a problem. But he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? I think I've done everything I'm supposed to do before God, but when you talk about love your neighbor as yourself, who is my neighbor? And so Jesus tells him this parable of the man who went down from Jerusalem down to Jericho, he fell among robbers, among thieves. They grabbed him, beat him, took everything, left him for dead, and stripped him naked. And along comes down from Jerusalem, down to Jericho, the, the, the priest, probably finishing up his term. He's served. He's done all these religious things. And he's got this garment and he's all purified. And I'm going home and my family's at home. I can't wait to get home. And there is a problem. And that is a man. And he is in a real bad place. And I'm busy. Passes over on the other side. Then comes the Levite. The Levite is the assistant, you know, to the priests, and he knows all the right things, knows the law, knows what he should do, sees the man in need, and does the same and passes over on the other side, leaves the man. 
Then comes the Samaritan, and the Samaritan sees the man, and he goes over to that man, and he binds him up, and he gets his medicine kit. That's going to cost him something now, and now it's starting to get into his own wallet, and he ministers, and now his clothes are affected by this man's blood, and he's taken off his clothes, and he's binding this man up, and now he's not going to be using his donkey for himself anymore. Now he puts this man on the donkey, and we have an ambulance, and he takes him to an inn, and then he checks him in the inn, and he gets him situated, and with the innkeeper, he says, hey, here's the deal. I'm going to pay for everything for this man, and when I come back, you keep a record, and everything that he is, is, is required for this man to be brought back to dignity, to brought back to life, you put it on my account, and I'll pay for it. And then Jesus turns the whole thing on its edge. And he turns the word into a verb and he says, now who is neighbor to him? You ask me, who's my neighbor? And Jesus turns it around and says, who is neighbor? Listen to the man's answer, this, this lawyer. Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him, what's the word? Mercy. Mercy. He couldn't even say Samaritan because he had no mercy in his heart. He had no love for God. He would not admit I'm spiritually bankrupt. He would not mourn over his sin. He simply wants to justify myself. I'm doing enough, right? But he understood from this, Jesus' point of this was the one who showed him mercy. That helps us understand mercy. Jesus, in his life, he illustrated mercy. In his teaching, he illustrated mercy. He is the merciful and faithful high priest. It wasn't just what he said, beloved, it's what he did. It's the gospel. Through his life, death, burial, resurrection, Christianity, beloved, knows nothing of deism. That God created everything and walked away and he doesn't care. He came and, Luther said, he sunk himself into our flesh. He experienced the need of humanity and he went to the cross in our place, beloved, so that the writer of Hebrews could write, therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. He didn't offer someone else's sacrifice. He offered himself. He's merciful, he's faithful. So mercy is exemplified in Jesus' teaching and through his life. But where is it going? If we are going to be mercied by God, then it will lead to us being merciful to others. Mercy expressed. That's our fourth point here. Oh, that we would imagine prayerfully how God might use us as vessels of mercy that we would, as we said a couple weeks ago, leverage every opportunity, except political. You don't have to factor that in. Political doesn't matter. You can just do whatever you want to do. I'm being facetious. Leverage every opportunity for God's glory and man's good. Every opportunity. Beloved, we are moving forward by faith. We are by the provision and grace of the Lord we plan to leverage the corner of 30 mile and forest to do the greatest amount of good we can in making disciples who make disciples. It isn't, it's what, Russ, you said it so beautifully that night. It's not about a building. The building will be nice. The building will be wonderful. It's about the people. And if we are not merciful people, who cares about a building? Do we understand this? Romans 9.23 I plagiarized Paul's verse to get the title for the sermon, okay? I'll just be I'll level with you. <laughs> to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. That's us. Vessels of mercy. Elsewhere, we're jars of clay. What do we hold in us? The gospel. Mercy. For what? To pour it out. To share it with others. Fruit is the evidence of root, beloved. Fruit is the evidence of root. Are we abounding in mercy or are we lacking more mercy toward others? What kind of fruit are we bearing? 
fruit is the evident. So when Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, this is what he's dealing with. In Matthew 18, there's a master and he summons a servant and he says, hey, I hear there's some of my money missing and it was put into your care. Where is it? It was an immeasurable debt that the man squandered and lost. It was gone. And the man, the servant, he, he's a wicked servant. He cries out, have mercy on me. I'll pay it all back. He couldn't. No way. And the master then says to him, I forgive you. You can go. What's he saying? I'll take your debt on me. You lost what was mine. You should have to repay it. The debt has to go somewhere. It'll fall on me. You can go. He goes out. He finds a person that owes, what, 100 bucks? Grabs him by the neck. You owe me money. The servants are standing around. They're looking at the scene unfolding. They're like, wait, 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 wait. You were just in there and got forgiven the immeasurable debt, and you're out here after this guy for pennies on the dollar. What is the matter with you? They go tell the master. The master says, get back in here. You wicked servant. Did I not forgive you everything? And you went out and you couldn't forgive a little bit of nothing? Now, what is Jesus teaching there? That if you have been saved and you're not forgiving, then then God will strike your salvation? No, that's not what he's saying. That would go against other teaching and other doctrine. He's saying that if you have been forgiven, then you will, help me out, forgive. If you have not been forgiven, what will you really struggle to do? Forgive. So forgiving people are forgiven people. Merciful people have been mercied by God. So think about this. Let this sink in now. Sinclair Ferguson, if we do not show mercy to others, we show that we either, and so here he's gracious, we either understand little of that mercy. Maybe you are a Christian and you're struggling in mercy. Maybe you understand little. You can grow in this by which we have been saved, or else, here's another option, you've never actually received it. And in which case, I'm inviting you to receive trust, receive the mercy of the Lord today, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Good Samaritan, what what happened? He saw the need, and he put himself on the line, and he went, beloved, fruit is the evidence of root. If we're going to be a church that is serving, guess what's going to be required of us as disciples of Jesus? We're actually going to have to risk. We might have to risk getting a coronavirus. But in light of eternity, it's worth it. Because we see the plight and the misery of people who are overcoming brokenness and hurt and wrong and depression. And we aren't content, listen to me clearly now, to sit in my safe bubble of my house while the world does whatever it has to do. No, we saw those two guys in the parable. Oh, by the grace of God and the mercies of Christ that we will present our bodies as living sacrifices holy and acceptable to God. And Paul says that, Romans 12, 1, is just our reasonable service. It's not asking anything big because we know who we are. We know we didn't deserve mercy and God's given us mercy. So do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Oh, may God work this in us. Mercy, beloved, will open doors that human might cannot. Mercy in a message will unlock a heart where anger and me just spitting and frothing and just just being angry and mad. Think about it now. When you watch events unfold on TV, does it make you sick and angry and mad? And why? Do you care about the people that are on the other side of the aisle? And understand in the church, we have people on both sides of an aisle here. And we're called to minister mercy to those that we disagree with. Not just the people, uh, who's my neighbor, pastor? Who do I have to show mercy to? The people that put the banner I had in my yard in their yard, right? You know better than that. We're called to be vessels of mercy. We understand what we believe. 
but we also understand that God is in control and he's sovereign. Listen to what Calvin wrote 500 years ago. Christ says that those are happy who are not only prepared to endure their own afflictions, but to take a share in the afflictions of others. What does that look like? Who assist the wretched, who willingly take part with those who are in distress, who clothe themselves, as it were, with the same affections, that they may be more readily disposed to render them assistance. What is that? That's having compassion on someone. It's trying to care about them and get to know them and not just stop at whatever the divide may be. How merciful are we as a church, beloved? Where do we need to grow in God's mercy? Not any of us would say, oh, I'm most merciful, that's me. Now we know we need to grow. But let the red flags and the alarms go off if you don't care about showing God's mercy. And who is it hardest to show mercy to? To be just fully honest, I can be most merciful to people that are all around me, neighbors, church members. You know the hardest person for me to show mercy to? My wife teases me all the time. When she's sick, I'm like, whoop, gotta go, you know? Like, eh, all right, you know? And we, we laugh about that, but the per- people that are closest to us in our church family, at what point would we, ch- would we say, you know what, no mercy for you? And I need to find a new church where people are merciful to me there. Do you understand how how convoluted that is? And people just go from church to church to church to church to church, and they're waiting for the people to meet their standards. I'm just asking you, you're sensible people. Work it out with Jesus' message. Does it say that's a people who live countercultural? Or is that like everybody else? They offend you at Target, so go to Walmart. Oh, they defended you at Walmart? Go to wherever else. Pick a place. Beloved, we are called to be different. Merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive, say it with me, mercy. Don't we need God's mercy more than ever? Does our nation need God's mercy? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Am I seriously concerned about the unborn continuing to be neglected? Yes. So then what will we do? Bemoan? Sit in our house and just cry? Or go find someone to show mercy to? And do something in the face of all of the political unrest? I think that we know what the Lord would instruct us to do. Go make a difference. Let's stand together. Oh, Lord, thank you for giving to us your mercy. Lord, will you forgive us, forgive me for being self-centered way too much instead of being merciful. Lord, will you use me, will you use us as a body of believers to be vessels of mercy, to come alongside those who are hurting, to minister effectively to each person that you bring into our lives, Lord. Make us instruments of mercy. We cannot do it without you. Lord, for the one who may be hearing this message today and whatever day they're listening to it through a podcast or through YouTube or our webpage, whatever the outlet may be, Father, I pray if they have never received your mercy, if they have never cried out to you, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, that they would hear the call of the gospel of the Holy Spirit to them, and today would be the day of their salvation. For you are good, and you are merciful, and you are waiting to receive sinners. We praise you, O Lord. For Jesus' sake and for his glory alone, amen. Thank you again for listening to Teaching from the Word at Grace Community Church. We are located in Richmond, Michigan. You can find us online at mygracechurch.com. Please subscribe and follow us at My Grace Church. It would be greatly appreciated if you would take a moment to rate, like, 
and share this message. We want you to always remember that you are loved.